So well, I have the great luxury of time. You know, unlike my my colleagues in daily reporting, and they, it's really it, that's a hard thing to do. Always to get the, I I have time to go back over things and so on and so forth. But the, um, you know, I, I'm not satisfied, and I'm sure Deo isn't that that everything that he remember, remembers is, rem, is remembered with perfect accuracy. And I tried, it's not the main reason I did this, but one of the reasons why that, this book is broken in two, where the first, with, with the exception of this little prologue, it kind of establishes an I, a first person narrator, uh, th then, then leaves that narrator a long way behind. And, and the whole first part is Deo's memories entirely, my words mostly, but his, his memories <clears throat> and the second part, I, pretty early on, I just think I just do it in a phrase, but I wanted to acknowledge openly the, the fact that, of course, the youngest of these memories is 12 years old, you know. They, of, of course, some of this can't be exactly the way it was, and, I'm, and there were things he'd forgotten, he just couldn't tell me. I remember, you know, I try not to grill people, I try to be a decent guest in their lives, but, you know, there, this was hard for him to go back over this ground. And it was one of the reasons initially that I went to Burundi and Rwanda and, of course, to New York with him, which wasn't as hard. Um, it was as though, uh, but, but I remember asking him uh, repeatedly about this one incident in that place, horrible place in Rwanda, Murambi, where the, this a gigantic massacre took place that he narrowly escaped. And we, we had stood right there and he, sh he pointed to the places in the landscape where he, how he had gone around it. And... Um, and I kept asking him questions and questions. And finally, I think it was about this. He finally said, I just don't remember that. Fair enough. You know, so I have to sort of <laughs> call a halt there. And there was a lot, you know, I worry. I think if one does. You know, if you're writing nonfiction and, you get, and you're interested in trying to get it right. I mean, I do remember saying to him, one of my stupider questions, um, among many, but this was one of the stupid ones. Was do you think there was any chance we could find that woman who helped him across the river in Rwanda? He said, "I never even knew her name. You know, she's probably not alive." And, and then, as for the idea of finding the guy who helped him in New York, a guy named Muhammad, that's the only name he knew, who is now back in Senegal, that would be kind of tough to find yeah. Muhammad in Senegal. I think. <clears throat> so that was t that was difficult. But I I was able to talk to everyone in New York. Um, except for the, the, the store manager. Um, couldn't find him. We, tr we, we didn't look for him one day. Um, and so, I, you know, I, and, and, and the other thing that satisfied me that this story, the whole story was in its entrails true, as, as a great writer, A.J. Liebling once put it, um, was being there with him in Rwanda and Burundi and seeing, it was as though these memories were, um, you know, there were some kind of spores or, or bacteria that were, you know, going dormant and waiting for his return. It was kind of horrifying in places, particularly at that remnant of the, hosp remnant of the hospital we were. And I, I never forget him trying this door. And, th and I didn't know at the moment, you know, he, he was in this sort of weird, angry trance. And that had been the door to the room where he had, um, where he had left the door open. <coughs> he couldn't get it open. It was <coughs> anyway, <laughs> come to think of it, I should have not remarked on that. Um, sorry. <laughs>